Yes. So um, today we are gathered in this online space together on a very meaningful day because June 25th of 1950 is when it is officially recognized as the beginning date of the Korean War. And today actually marks the 70th year since then. Still, there is no peace agreement and the war endures along with its traumas and aftermath. It took lives of approximately 2 million civilians and troops and separated countless families along the border. So I'd like all of us from where you are sitting right now to take a brief moment of silence for the countless victims of the Korean War. Let's take a moment of silence. Thank you. And now, finally, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Bruce Cummings, who many of you already know very well as the leading authority and expert on the history of the Korean War and on East Asia relations. Dr. Bruce Cummings is the Gustavus and Ann Swift Distinguished Service Professor in History and the former chair of the History Department at the University of Chicago. His work on the Korean War has been acclaimed as the most important revisionist account by his colleagues and his scholarly contributions have been recognized by him winning several distinguished awards, including John King Fairbank Book Award of the American Historical Association, Quincy Wright Book Award of the International Studies Association and Kim Dae-jun Prize for scholarly tr contributions to democracy. And while I do not want to digress too much, I do want to share my personal appreciation for his alliance for democracy in South Korea and for his friendship and support for my grandfather, late President Kim Dae-jung. Dr. Cummings was my grandfather's trusted partner in his struggle for democracy in South Korea, especially during my grandfather's exile to the United States during the Chunduan regime in the early 80s. It was a very dangerous situation when my grandfather made the decision to return to Korea from the exile because people worried that there even could be a threat of assassination. So a group of Americans volunteered to accompany my grandfather uh, for his return back to Korea to protect him and act as human barricades. And Dr. Bruce Cummings was one of them. So Dr. Cummings, I am deeply thankful for you standing alongside my grandfather and also for standing alongside the South Koreans as they fought for democracy. I'd also like to introduce Ms. Catherine Killo, who will moderate today's conversation. Ms. Killo is the advocacy and leadership coordinator of Women Cross DMZ. Most recently, she was the Roger Halle Fellow of Plowshares Fund and helped build and manage an advocacy coalition in support of US North Korea diplomacy. Her work and commentary can be found in many different places, including the Washington Post, Newsweek, Foreign Policy, and so on. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bruce Cummings and Ms. Catherine Killo. The floor is all yours, Dr. Cummings and Catherine. Thank you very much, uh, Chongde. You uh, reminded me of your grandfather, whom I first met in 1973 at the University of Washington when I was teaching a summer course there. And seven years later, uh, Kim Dae-jung was uh, accused of sedition because of the Gwangju Rebellion by the Chunduan regime. And in the indictment, they brought up remarks that he made in my classroom in 1973. So there was a spy there. And I can tell you, there were only about eight students. And that was the kind of uh, situation that your grandfather dealt with. He, he was under threat uh, most of his life uh, from the militarists in Korea. I wanted to thank Elizabeth Cho and Hyun Lee, Lin-ji Kang, uh, Chongde, uh, Catherine Kilo uh, for setting up this as folks really did a lot of hard work. And I, uh, above all, I don't know all the other groups that were mentioned sponsoring this, but I do know about the women cross the DMZ and I greatly respect uh, 
uh, what that organization has done to try and bring the two Koreas together over recent years. Uh, I just want to make a few points uh, in about 10 minutes before uh, we get to uh, the Q&A. Americans have started to talk about forever wars, uh, like the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq. It's something new. Uh, but the original forever war uh, is the war in Korea. And even though the peace has generally been held by an armistice since 1953, uh, the, uh, the war is not over and it could resume almost uh, at any time. I was watching the uh, PBS NewsHour a few minutes ago and they had a section on 70 years of uh, US-Korean relations, the war and all of that. It's very typical that they do not realize that it's 75 years and not 70. Uh, the US sent 25,000 troops into Korea uh, in September of 1945. They set up a three year military government. They left uh, a military advisory group uh, up until the war. Uh, and <clears throat> most people don't even know about it. They may know about the occupation of Japan or Germany, but they don't know about the occupation of Korea, and yet the US had a very central role in shaping uh, much of uh, South Korean history ever since by the people they chose to work with. The State Department disagreed with Franklin Roosevelt's policy on Korea. Uh, Roosevelt wanted a trusteeship, which we can talk about if you want, uh, but the State Department wanted a preponderant role in Korea and they felt the only way they could do that was with the military occupation. And so Roosevelt died in February, 1945 uh, and we got a military occupation. Why? The primary reason was the State Department thought uh, Korean guerrillas, which they put as high as 30,000 uh, would come back from World War II and Manchuria and easily uh, take over Korea. And of course, Kim Il-sung was the most famous of those guerrillas and he, was, he had come to the attention of the State Department uh, during World War II. So we went in trying to block uh, Kim Il-sung and today we're still blocking his grandson, Kim Jong-un. Only he's got nuclear weapons and missiles, intercontinental missiles. So this is just a colossal strategic failure when it comes to American uh, policy toward North Korea. It, it shows us how easy it is to get into a war. It happened overnight uh, when the US intervened in 1950 and how desperately hard it is to get out of that war. We were still locked in a very dangerous uh, embrace uh, with the North Koreans. And of course, what we do to them and have done since 1949 before the Korean War is to slap on embargoes and, and uh, sanctions. Probably North Korea is the most sanctioned country in the world right now. Certainly it is the most sanctioned country uh, over the last uh, 71 years. And I don't know any positive result that's come from that. A great deal of hostility uh, has emanated from these policies, but they don't work. Let me make a second major point about our forever wars. There've been five major wars since 1945 and we only won one of them. Uh, that was the Persian Gulf War in 1991. And in, in many ways that was a, a Pyrrhic victory uh, because uh, the, the W. Bush administration decided to continue that war by trying to, uh, for regime change uh, in Iraq. You have a stalemate in Korea a defeat in Vietnam, a probable defeat in Afghanistan. I mean, the ta Taliban are stronger than they were when we invaded Afghanistan and civil wars in Iraq that still uh, are not solved. In all these cases, the, the central problem was political. In Korea and Vietnam in particular, uh, revolutionary nationalism in countries immediately emerging from colonialism, Japanese, or French colonialism. Uh, American leaders had absolutely no appreciation of the force 
of third world nationalism and anti-colonialism. Uh, and they paid a very stiff price by underestimating our enemies uh, in both uh, North Korea and North Vietnam. A third point which we can discuss is that this is allegedly the start of the Korean War uh, on June 25th. And for Americans, uh, you know, A, this has been the original sin of North Korea. And B, it has the great virtue of ignoring everything that went before uh, June 25th, uh, 1950. The uh, American military occupation is, is just unknown. Uh, or no, if it's known, it's forgotten. But the start of the war is very interesting when you look at border fighting uh, along the 38th parallel, starting in May of 1949 and going until uh, almost January of 1950. The majority of that fighting, uh, often it was major fighting, was started by South Korea. Now, this is not my judgment, but the judgment of General Roberts, who was the commander of our military advisory group uh, at that time. Then there was a quiet period of six months until June of 1950. And the great North Korean mistake uh, or error uh, was not to be able to link up the border fighting and guerrilla fighting in South Korea uh, with their move toward conventional warfare uh, in June 1950. And I can say a lot about that. I have said a lot about it uh, and I'd be happy to, to discuss it, but it, it became a kind of decent interval for the United States for what an <laughs> ambassador uh, John Muccio said in his oral history uh, that when the North Korean invasion came, it was fortunately clear cut. It would not have been clear cut at all uh, in 1949. But one thing I've tried to get across uh, to a lot of people with, I think, to no avail is that Korea belongs to the Koreans and the North Koreans invaded Korea. So you have Koreans invading Korea as part of a long struggle, struggle going back not just to the 1940s, but into the guerrilla fighting in the 1930s. I mean, think about it. The commander of the parallel in 1949 on the Southern side was Kim so -gwan a colonel in the Japanese army named Kaneyama, uh, who chased down Kim Il-sung in Manchuria. Uh, and as recently as 2007 was uh, greatly lauded by the Japanese for his exploits. And of course, North Korea and Japan have no relationship whatever, uh, just as the US does not have diplomatic relations with North Korea either. And so for the North Koreans who are laser focused on this history, uh, they haven't settled things with Japan or South Korea or the United States. And here we are in 2020. A lot of recent scholarship uh, has really, I would say not changed, but deepened my view of the origins of this war. Uh, Hwang Soo Byung, a scholar at Sydney University wrote, Korea's a grievous war. It's just a great book. And it focuses on four episodes of extreme violence in Korea during the war and before. Uh, and when you read that book, you realize the Korean war was one of the most violent wars in history, uh, not just the soldiers uh, facing up to each other and dying, uh, but hundreds of thousands of civilians who were killed in political massacres, primarily uh, by the South, uh, either by the government or by uh, right-wing youth groups. And you have also uh, Hun Jun Kim, massacres at Mount Hala, about the Jeju-do uh, uprising in 1948 and the fighting that uh, took 10% of the lives on Jeju-do, uh, Jeju Island uh, in the next couple of years. When I think about that and read those excellent new books, I just think there was no way the North Koreans were ever gonna allow uh, all of this to go on in the South as their leftist friends were slaughtered. Uh, they were not gonna allow that to go on. 
And so a war was probably inevitable with the American division of Korea in August 1945, but it was uh, almost entirely predictable once South Korean forces started uh, slaughtering leftists uh, willy nilly. That's basically what I wanted to say. I think I've taken up my 10 minutes uh, of time for this uh, brief uh, talk. But I do want to say that under uh, President Moon, I've been heartened by his policies toward the North and his many, many, many attempts to get the United States to do something to break the log jam uh, in Korea, to end the war, uh, to lift sanctions, to reestablish economic ties like at the Kaesong uh, industrial zone. And Donald Trump uh, seems to have washed his hands entirely of, of uh, this whole issue since uh, he met in Hanoi uh, with Kim Jong-un. Uh, there's much that could be done and Moon Jae-in still has two, two years in power. Uh, I think he's right along with Kim Dae-jung and Noh Moo-hyun in, in trying uh, by all means to uh, uh, find a way toward a peaceful reconciliation and reunification uh, between North and South. Uh, so I, I just wanted I just wanted to say that because uh, it's so different from Park Geun Hye and uh, her predecessor, and really all the right wing governments that have been in power in South Korea, who, whose basic policy toward the North is it should disappear uh, tomorrow morning. And if they can do something to help that along, they'd be very happy. Well, thank you very much for listening and I'll be glad to see if I can answer uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Cummings. Um, can you hear me all right? Sure. Great. Um, I really appreciate your opening remarks. I think it's um, really important context setting for the rest of our conversation. We're just gonna take the next 20 minutes to have a more moderated discussion. Um, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for uh, Q&A for the rest of the time. Um, well, as, as you very rightly point out, um, the Korean War is a deeply underappreciated event in US history. Um, I've personally been really looking forward to this conversation with you. Um, as someone who grew up in the US, um, I've been on a long journey to understand my own Korean family's history and in many respects to unlearn the um, distorted conventional narrative on Korea that um, those of us growing up in the US have had to do. Uh, and your books were some of um, my earliest introductions to this process of unlearning. So thank you. Well, thank um, you. But uh, with all that said, I, I thought it would only be appropriate to start with a question that challenges this very date, June 25th. Um, this day is recognized as the official start of the Korean War, but uh, many people, yourself included, have uh, disputed this date. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about why it's useful to problematize June 25th as the start of the Korean War? Well, first, it, it's a, a political judgment uh, to say the war started on June 25th. Uh, it's the official story of the United, Na uh, of the United States and the United Nations. Uh, and always those official stories uh, need to be challenged. I, uh, Chongdae mentioned that I was a revisionist um, historian and I don't actually like that term very much because all historians should be revising the existing literature when they publish. But I actually got into the archives of the American military government in 1972, a long time ago, uh, and was the first person to publish a book based on actual top secret information that even Koreans could not see because Koreans could not see top secret classification uh, documents. And it, it, it was possible therefore uh, 
uh, not just to revise, but in many ways to rewrite the history of the American military occupation. But there wasn't, uh, it wasn't a revisionist book. In many ways, it was the first grounded uh, account based on primary materials that were you know, undeniable. And I just wanted to say that for the students uh, you know, that may be listening, that uh, it's just so important to go to the sources to the top secret materials once they're declassified and you see a very different picture. Now as to June 25th, uh, anybody with any fairness in mind and justice in mind can go to the 1949 volume of the Foreign Relations of the US, which is put out 30 or 35 years after the fact, full of top secret documents. And you see all of this about the border fighting and a very near war that came in August 1949 when Syngman Rhee wanted to punish the North Koreans by attacking across the border uh, to uh, Chuncheon, a small city across the border at that time, now it's in South Korea. Uh, and the US ambassador had to move heaven and earth to keep him from doing that and starting what the ambassador called a civil war. And then you look on the Soviet side, the Soviet documents, they're trying to restrain Kim Il-sung at the same time from teaching uh, Syngman Rhee a lesson in August, 1949. So that civil war, situation is the essence of the Korean conflict. Uh, the US involved itself for reasons having very little, little to do with Korea, mainly uh, to keep a front yard defense for Japan. Uh, they couldn't care less about uh, saving South Korea, really. Uh, you can see, again, see that in, in secret documents. Uh, but the 38th parallel was just a line, line drawn by Dean Ruskin and uh, John J. McCloy uh, a day after Nagasaki was obliterated, uh, August 10th and 11th, 1945, and the Koreans never made a single commitment to it. It wasn't an international border. Uh, and in that sense, the Korean War was quite similar to, to the Vietnam War. You have the Americans trying to claim aggression by the Northern side within their own country. Thank you. Um, I actually, since you mentioned um, Nagasaki, and uh, I wanted to, well, one, bring up a, a sort of irony I find today and how U.S. policy is obviously um, principally concerned uh, with North Korea's nuclear weapon program, uh, which began in earnest in the 1990s, but many people may be surprised that, um, and in fact, many U.S. lawmakers are loath to acknowledge, um, that the US first introduced nuclear weapons um, to the Korean Peninsula uh, in 1958, um, which was an obvious violation of the armistice agreement. Um, even the State Department legal advisor at the time um, cautioned against doing so for that very reason. Um, even though the US has since removed nuclear weapons from uh, South Korea, uh, it still maintains nuclear assets in the region and South Korea is um, technically under the US nuclear umbrella. And the Trump administration today is actively um, working to expand and modernize uh, our nuclear arsenal. So uh, could you talk a little bit more about how the US's nuclear legacy in the region can help us understand um, how that may have informed North Korea's own nuclear strategy? Well, there were discussions in 1957 on the National Security Council, which anybody can read uh, at the Eisenhower Library. Uh, and they, you're right, the legal advisor and even John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State made clear that to introduce nuclear weapons into South Korea uh, would violate uh, the armistice. Uh, they talked it over and finally basically said, what the hell, we're gonna do it anyway. Uh, tactical or battlefield nuclear weapons had just come in uh, and the US military, the Pentagon and civilian advisors were very much enamored of the idea of getting a bigger bang for the buck by using nuclear, small nuclear weapons in battlefield circumstances. 
And in many ways, Korea was the perfect place to do that. Uh, even though we had nuclear, we introduced uh, tactical nuclear weapons in Europe, uh, you had a big problem and that was that the Soviets uh, had their own nuclear weapons, uh, massive nuclear weapons. Uh, whereas in Korea, uh, North Korea had no nuclear weapons and the Soviet Union and China were not gonna defend North Korea in a nuclear war. So up in, you know, from 1958 to 91, our standard operating procedure, if the North Koreans uh, invaded again and were doing well, was to use nuclear weapons very early in a war like that. And South Korean uh, generals got used to the idea that the US would just nuke uh, North Korea and that would be the end of it. Uh, now, the North Koreans of course wanted their own nuclear weapons because the only way you can really deal with a nuclear adversary is to have your own nuclear weapons. That's the essence of nuclear deterrence. But if a bunch of Quakers were running things in Pyongyang, they also would have wanted nuclear weapons. Uh, and it always surprises me that the North Koreans took as long as they did uh, to actually develop them. And when you, you know, I've written about this in two or three places, but when you actually pin it down, it was 2006 uh, after the invasion of Iraq where North Korea thought if Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons, the US would not have invaded which of course is true. Uh, so they went a long time before they actually had the weapons in hand. And I always thought in the, in the 90s, they were using their plutonium as a bargaining chip with the US because even if they got nuclear weapons, they'd have no chance uh, against the US uh, in a nuclear war. One more thing about this, uh, intimidating North Korea with nuclear weapons is a completely bipartisan affair. There were many crises with North Korea during the two terms of the Obama administration. And President Obama would just fly B-52s and B-2 bombers, uh, even dropped dummy bombs on South Korean islands just to intimidate the North Koreans and, and show them the face of a nuclear response uh, if there was another war. Uh, meanwhile, under the sea, uh, American submarines can obliterate North Korea uh, with submarine launched uh, ballistic missiles, uh, instantly obliterate North Korea. So North Korea really is in a situation of wanting a deterrent, but not really being able to use it or they'll get blasted to smithereens. It's just a terrible, terrible situation. It's extremely bleak. Um, I want to fast forward us into the present. Um, in the last week, you know, we've seen renewed tension um, on the Korean Peninsula. North Korea has been reversing all the steps that it had taken to demilitarize the DMZ since the Pyongyang summit. And their decision um, to demolish the liaison office recently, which they had warned that they would do ahead of time, um, seems like a very clear symbolic expression of of their frustration with the lack of progress um, on all the commitments made between the two Koreas since 2018. Um, and South Korea has not been able to move forward on, on its plans for joint cooperative projects, largely because of the US led sanctions regime and the maximum pressure campaign. What do you think about these latest dynamics and should we, there are a lot of people concerned about um, the possibility of renewed war in Korea. It, do you think that is something we should be concerned about right now? Well, I think we always should be concerned about that because of the hair trigger nature of uh, mutual deterrence uh, along the DMZ. Uh, I was sorry the North Koreans blew up the liaison office. I thought that was an important fruit of their negotiations with the South. Uh, yesterday, apparently, uh, Kim Jong-un declined uh, the military's request to do military exercises, which haven't been done for a long time. And I thought that was a possibly good sign. I do think what they're trying to do is uh, signal to Donald Trump uh, cause, to cause trouble, make him pay attention. But uh, I don't think Donald Trump is paying attention to anything but trying to get reelected. And I don't expect anything uh, to happen. Uh, between the US and North Korea until we get a new president. 
uh, next uh, January. I, I wanted to say one other thing about the Korean War that is very poorly understood. Uh, and, and that is that Americans may know very little about Korea or the Korean War, but it was the Korean War that created the national security situation that we still find ourselves in uh, with permanent military bases in 150 countries, 900 plus bases uh, with a huge standing army, which never happened before in American history, a national security state, uh, troops in Japan, South Korea and, and Germany by the tens of thousands still, I mean, 35,000 troops in, in uh, Germany, 50,000 in Japan. And nobody ever talks about this. It's hidden in plain sight. Uh, but we have done something no other country in history has done, which is place our troops all over the globe, and including on the territory of our competitors, economic competitors like Japan and Germany and England and Spain and Italy, uh, South Korea. That happened not because the war was in Korea, but because the war happened in 1950, when a lot of these things were unresolved and suddenly defense spending quadrupled in the first six months of the Korean War. And there was money for everything. Bases all over the world, uh, a hugely funded CIA and Pentagon. And that's the world we still live in. Uh, I just wanted to make that clear because it's a very important war from the American standpoint, let alone uh, the Korean standpoint. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you making that point. Um, it's something that Americans take for granted today about the US. So much of um, uh, the war economy as we know it today was really ushered in um, during the, the Korean War. Um, before we get to questions, uh, and we're going to get to questions right after um, uh, this one that I have for you, um, you've been advocating for ending the Korean War for literal decades. Um, that's not a dig on your age. That's a dig on how long this war is. You can dig um, on my age if you want. <laughs> well, so as I was preparing for this, um, <laughs> I, I came across a, a great article you wrote in 1997 for The Atlantic, um, in which you say that the U.S. bears the greatest responsibility for peace on the Korean Peninsula and for failing to resolve the Korean conflict. 20 years later, you know, we're still here, we're still mired in this um, unended state of war. But we do have a resolution in Congress, um, HRES 152, which calls for a formal end to the Korean War. And it's led by many of the progressive Democrats. This isn't an insignificant measure of progress. Um, so I wanted to emphasize it and ask you if you could speak to Congress members um, right now about why it's imperative to support this bill and end the war, uh, what would you say to them? Well, I was in a way trying to speak to influential people in Washington with that Atlantic article, because at the time I wrote it, uh, there were so-called four power talks with China, the Soviet Union and the two Koreas um, to bring an end to the Korean War. And Bill Clinton was, I think, doing his best to try and make that happen. I thought it was going to happen uh, between 1998 and 2000, but it, it never did. Uh, what did happen is that George W. Bush came in and uh, reversed everything that was going on with North Korea. Uh, Kim Dae-jung was the first foreign president that met with George W. Bush and, and Bush treated him like, uh, you know, some sort of mendicant uh, uh, from, from a, you know, dependent country, very, you know, very uh, lacking in any kind of grace or welcome for Kim Dae-jung. And that was the end of it. And Bush went on you know, to invade uh, Iraq and he, he's deeply responsible for the fact that North Korea uh, developed nuclear weapons, as I said a while ago. But I, uh, I remain optimistic about Korea because first of all, when you get to know North Koreans, you find out they're human beings like anybody else with good sense of humor and people you can deal with uh, but South Korea has changed so much in my lifetime 
And it's so full of uh, young people like yourself and the others here tonight who are concerned about their country, uh, very well informed and operate in a free democratic atmosphere in South Korea so they don't get arrested uh, and tortured uh, like happened for 40 years uh, up until the 1990s. And that, that really, uh, you know, when I won that uh, Kim Dae-jung Human Rights Award, it, it meant a lot to me because uh, it seemed to me, not that I did much, but that the Korean people had done so much uh, over a 40 or 50 year period to build the, the strong civil society and democracy that we see today. And that is bound someday to include North Koreans. The North Korean leadership is not going to take over the South. Uh, but the more peacefully and uh, incrementally and carefully that's done, uh, the better. But I am, I am optimistic simply because South Korea, well, I mean, they showed us how to deal with the coronavirus and the American leaders haven't figured that out yet. Thank you, Dr. Cummings. Um, we're gonna spend the next chunk of time taking questions from the audience. I apologize to everyone in advance as we can't uh, get to every question, but we'll do our best. Um, the first one I see here, is there anything we can learn about hope for transforming US foreign policy in light of John Bolton's new book or does it dim our hope? Um, have you had a, a chance to, to look at John Bolton's memoir or passages from it? Well, I, I just watched him give a, a several fairly long interviews, including almost an hour long interview last night. John Bolton is a gutter snipe who has done nothing but try to cause trouble uh, in American foreign policy. He's wanted to overthrow the regime in North Korea by force. Uh, Trump actually got in his way uh, of doing that. He was another big supporter of regime change in Iraq. Uh, he's the kind of ignoramus who thinks he knows everything and doesn't know anything about a country like North Korea or Iraq. And I, I can't give him much of a pass uh, just because he wrote a book critical of Donald Trump. I mean, I could fall asleep and write a book critical of Donald Trump. Uh, one thing I did hear today is that all the anecdotes in this book seem to work out where uh, John Bolton is uh, uh, getting the best of everybody else. He's a megalomaniac. He just controls it better than Trump does. And, and it's a disgrace that he's served in almost every administration since uh, uh, George W. Bush. Yes, I think we all share in our um, feelings <laughs> uh, about John Bolton. Um, relatedly, there's another question um, about uh, keeping it to US politics. If Biden is elected president, do you think he would begin discussions with North Korea or would he refuse to follow through with anything Trump started just as Trump refused to follow through with anything Obama started? Well, let me sort of rephrase um, my point, Sarah. I mean, Obama gave up on North Korea uh, after the so-called Leap Day agreement fell through in 2014, I guess it was. Um, and I, I thought he had reached out to Burma and to uh, Iran and a number of other countries and he could have done more on North Korea. I think Biden would be very much like Obama. Uh, their basic policy is to sanction and embargo North Korea, not to talk to them if North Korea is acting up in some way uh, and to see the nuclear problem entirely through the lenses of non-proliferation. I mean, that was the problem with Clinton's policy, uh, with Obama's, and I think Biden would probably start off in the same way, 70 years of sanctioning North Korea and no progress whatsoever. Uh, what I think should happen is that the sanctions should be uh, gradually lifted, embargoes lifted, uh, help the North Korean economy so they can feed their people and normalize relations with Pyongyang. I mean, it's been 75 years since Literally, General Hodge, the head of our occupation in 1945, refused to have anything to do with uh, the North Koreans, Kim Il-sung and others. Uh, so 
And what is that phrase? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I can repeat it exactly, but what is the definition of insanity? It's, it's when you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again and get no results. Right, right. That's exactly the phrase. Um, there's a, a really interesting question here. Um, what is one key fact you wish more South Korean and North Korean people would realize respectively about the Korean War that's not often uh, discussed within their own domestic narratives or historical memory? Well, I, I did a picture book with John Halliday back in 1988. Uh, I got the, these photos on the Korean War out of the American archives mainly. And it was at that time that I realized what an unholy slaughter the war was for civilians. Uh, with the South Korea, as I said earlier, probably killing as much as half a million civilians uh, before and during the war for political reasons. Uh, North Korea, uh, because their enemies were much fewer, uh, frankly, was less violent in terms of massacres. But uh, if you were a landlord or a policeman who served the Japanese, you were in a lot of, of deep trouble in North Korea. And then the US just uh, blatantly bombed the hell out of North Korea without any limits. Uh, Nepal was used all over North Korea. Hardly a building, a modern building was standing at the end of the war. Most cities were razed to the ground. Probably 2 million uh, uh, people died in that bombing campaign, which was similar to what we did uh, to Germany and Japan in 1943-44. But North Korea had about 16 cities and they were wiped out to a greater degree even than the firebombing in Germany and Japan. Now this should be common knowledge in the US. I'd say two things that, that happen to me when I give lectures around this country. If I talk about the bombing as I just did, People come up to me after the lecture and I say, I've never heard of anything of this. This is really something. Wow, Nepal was used all over the place. Uh, and the second thing is when I talk about nuclear weapons in South Korea, people, I still have people coming up saying, are you sure that there were American nuclear weapons in South Korea? Where'd you get that? I mean, it, it's almost as if there's a blanket of ignorance uh, in the US about uh, Korea and the Korean War. But for South Koreans and North Koreans, I just think the horrible bloodletting that all sides engaged in just tells us we can never have another internecine war in Korea. Thank you, Bruce. Um, this question uh, is one that um, we get a lot in, in Washington and um, I think it's, it's on the top of a lot of people's minds, especially if they, um, aren't very familiar with um, what's happening in Korea. Uh, do you believe denuclearization should be a prerequisite to peace um, in the peninsula? Um, at least for US policy, it's very clearly the case that um, peace can't come until uh, the North Korea unilaterally um, dismantles its nuclear program. Whereas I, I think for our campaign, um, you know, we, we really see the issue of peace and denuclearization um, as being on equal footing um, and that peace can come before denuclearization. But can you uh, respond to this question? Well, to wait for North Korea to denuclearize is to run into a whole host of problems, even if they were willing to do it. But one of them is that they can get rid of all their nukes and all their missiles, but they've got nuclear physicists who know how to make an atomic bomb. And so they can start it up right away again. And I actually saw someone a few years ago write that we, we ought to take North Korean nuclear physicists and you know put them on an island or something, because otherwise they can start up their program at any time. I mean, the cat is out of the bag and has been now for uh, a long time. Uh, North Korea is in effect a nuclear weapons state. Now, the other absurd uh, aspect of this is that the United States has a policy that if the North Korean regime were to collapse, to send the Marines charging into North Korea to gather up loose nukes. This is one of the most harebrained ideas I've ever heard. 
North Korea is 85% mountainous. Most of their military and nuclear facilities are deep underground. I can see American Marines, you know, running around the country uh, looking for these weapons uh, as if there's not going to be any resistance to this. And I was at Washington, uh, in Washington, maybe 15, 20 years ago at a, an open State Department conference. And uh, Chung In Moon, uh, Moon Chung In was at that conference. And that's when I first heard of this routine that we were going to send the Marines in to capture North Korean nuclear weapons. Oh, and the other thing they worry about is China might send their Marines in and we'd have to get in, in head to head with China as if North Koreans, all 25 million of them and a you know, 1.3 million man army don't count. Uh, but anyway, we listened carefully to these officials laying out this idea and we walked out and, and you know, Dr. Moon said to me, these people are crazy, you know, meet you no and you know, it's just true. They, they are crazy if they think that they are going to be able to uh, scarf up loose nukes if and when the North Korean regime ever collapses. You have to have some sort of hard-headed negotiation that would acknowledge the fact that the US can obliterate North Korea with nuclear weapons at any time it chooses. Uh, and you know, those Quakers, who might be running Pyongyang someday, they would probably want their own nukes in that situation. So my only hope is that you have a de facto recognition of North Korea as a nuclear weapon state and then a cap on their missiles and bombs so they don't get a, you know, a complete uh, arsenal of you know, 50 bombs and 100 missiles. But uh, the US has been anything but hard headed about dealing with this. They just don't think A, North Korea should exist, and B, that it should have nuclear weapons. Let's bring it back to the, the personal um, individual level. We have a question here. What can we, the citizens of South Korea, in and out of the peninsula, do to enhance the situation? Um, the, the Korean War situation at the individual level? Well, I think uh, Women Cross the DMZ is a perfect example of what people can do uh, to uh, try and bring the two Koreas together and to, to gain knowledge of the you know, ordinary folks in, in North Korea. Uh, there uh, are, are a number of other organizations, some of which uh, Chung Dae uh, listed in his introduction but what, you know, I'm a scholar and what moves me is good new scholarship. And I uh, am so thankful for uh, Huang Sukyung and uh, um, Henik Guan, Japanese guy named uh, Majimu Hajime. He wrote a great book on the Korean War. There's three books right there on the Korean War that everybody should, should read. They just cut through all the crap. I mean, they just brush aside uh, all the special pleading that we hear from all sides and tell you, you know, this war was hell uh, and it can't ever happen again. Um, this question sort of brings us back out, but it focuses on the role of the UN. How seriously damaging has the role of the UN been in the division of Korea and the tension on the peninsula. <laughs> this makes me laugh. I haven't thought of this in years, but uh, when I was a graduate student, Frank Baldwin, who was my advisor at Columbia, uh, historian of modern Korea, he gave me some research money uh, to do, you know, research assistance for him and to go down to the UN library and find out uh, what uh, they had, you know, on the UN's role uh, during the Korean War and after. So I dutifully took the subway down to the UN and spent a couple of days there. And basically all they had was public affairs reports from MacArthur's headquarters in Tokyo. Uh, he was the UN commander and he thought it would be really nice to send them the public affairs reports, by the way, which were almost always full of lies, like the Chinese are never coming into the war, so on and so forth. Uh, 
And I, I came back to Frank and I said, there's no research to be done unless you want to read public affairs uh, briefs from the Eighth uh, Army. But then later on, uh, I got into the actual secret stuff at the UN archives in New York, which is different than the UN itself. It's on Fifth Avenue someplace. And I was amazed at what I found. I mean, one of the most important things is that Kim so the, the, the commander that I mentioned earlier of the 38th parallel, he gave a lecture to the UN Commission on Korea in June, 1949, a year before uh, the invasion. And he said things like, you know, we're gonna attack and we'll have breakfast in Heju and lunch in Pyongyang and dinner in, in Shinwiju. And nobody's gonna stop us. And this is in the UN archives, complete transcript of what he said. There was no publicity whatsoever and the UN did nothing about it. And then in October, uh, the UN posted military observers, October, 1949, nine months before the war, they published, they, uh, they sent out two military observers because they were worried about a civil war in Korea. And guess what? When you see the secret stuff, the observers were supposed to watch South Korea, not North Korea. And then these two observers became instrumental in blaming the war on North Korea in June, 1950. So, the, I mean, the UN doesn't have a leg to stand on when it comes to allowing, you know, its great name to be, uh, you know, for the US to do whatever it wants with it. I mean, you, you can go to Yongsan military base and see them playing softball with blue UN shirts on still today. Uh, it, it's just a travesty. And the UN was never consulted. It never had a role. It always did what the US wanted. And I mean, if uh, I had time, I could get into some work on the US at the UN at the time. It was riddled with CIA spies, American CIA spies, just riddled. Uh, what is her name? Susan Haggard, I think. I, I'm, I can't remember her name, but she did a great book on the UN about 30 years ago and showed how the CIA was just all over everything. I think the recurring theme for tonight is to go straight to the archives. <laughs> <laughs> um, this next question uh, is a really important one. Um, if the US cannot be relied on to lead the way to peace in Korea, what more can the North and South do to move toward peace? Um, if the US is a key obstruction to peace, should the South ask the US military to leave? Well, I mean, I think the South always does that. It, it follows the American lead. Uh, it, uh, that works out well when you have a president like Moon Jae-in. Uh, it doesn't work out well uh, with some of the right wing presidents. But, you know, what I have to say will sound like a complete pipe dream, but it was the dream of Koreans in 1945. And that was that Korea is a country that has existed for the Koreans for millennia. I mean, 100, 500 years ago, everybody knew that Koreans lived south of the Yellow River. Uh, and it, it would be great if Koreans somehow got together and did what they wanted to do to reunify the country, regardless of what the US thinks. I mean, this might be something that was inching forward with Donald Trump because he wanted to get our troops out of Korea. He couldn't figure out why they were there. Uh, but that, of course, has gone by the board and we still have 28,000 troops in Korea. But I, I do think that the North goes overboard in saying only Koreans should have a role in these affairs. And I think South Korea is too dependent on, on the US, uh, all administrations too dependent on the US. Uh, and it would be good for them somehow to meet in the middle and figure out what they want to do as opposed to what Americans 7,000 miles away want to do. Yeah, it's um, this question of uh, troop withdrawal is hypersensitive in Washington. Um, Every year without fail, we see an amendment in the national defense bill um, to prohibit the removal of US troops from Korea. So it, it's definitely an important question to keep engaging in and to sustain. 
Um, this next question okay. comes from... One more thing about this. Um, oh, sure. Nomo Hyun wanted to get the Yongsan military base out of Seoul. Uh, and, you know, I tell people that it's the only capital in the world that has a gigantic military base within its uh, city limits. And that was, you know, when Nomo Hyun was president. And I went to a, a conference at the Brookings Institution, which had, unusually for me, I had a, a number of American military officers who had served in Korea. And I have to say, they were just going overboard saying how terrible President Nomi Hyun was. And doesn't he understand that if we move, you know, our first division, then the South Koreans gonna have to move their fourth division, blah, blah, blah. They were going on and on about how moving Yongsan was just so terrible. And, you know, I, I looked at them and I thought, who are these people fumbling around with the fate of 75 million Koreans. All they care about is getting, you know, stripes on their uniforms by serving in Korea. They, they can't pronounce a Korean name and get it straight. And they've only heard of two Koreans, which would be the one, you know, the president in, in South Korea and Kim Il-sung or whoever in North Korea. It's just appalling to, to, to actually hear these people talk. But all they wanted to do was dump all over, uh, you know, President No Mu Hyun for having the temerity to move an American military base out of the, out of the capital city. I think this segues really well to the next question, which is how does one effectively push back against US neoconservative voices who call for escalation in Korea? Well, you push back Something by saying that there never was a military solution in Korea. And we should have learned that in 1953 when we got stalemated by a bunch of peasants. Really, I mean, North Korean and Chinese peasant armies. Uh, and, you know, it's a hundred times more dangerous today with nuclear weapons. Uh, North Korea, you know, someday I would love to get into their archives because I'd love to see their security arrangements. I'll bet they're six and seven times removed from uh, any possibility of their leader being shot or assassinated or the regime overthrown. Uh, I mean, they've got everything underground, as I said earlier, and uh, there has never since 1955 been a serious uh, breach of the power uh, of the North Korean leadership. I mean, basically by the late 50s, Kim Il-sung was completely in charge and anybody who didn't like it could, you know, get their head lopped off. But uh, the fact is we, what's, you know, from the late fifties to the present, there has been no evidence of serious uh, disorder in the North Korean regime. So the neoconservatives can, you know, talk all they want, uh, but they're, you know, they're talking to a blind wall. They don't have any idea what they would deal with if they actually tried to invade North Korea. I mean, it's the most militarized state on the face of the earth. It has the fourth largest army, 1.3 million soldiers. It's a garrison state like the world has never seen. What are you gonna do about that army? You think people aren't gonna fight? I mean, it, 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 it's just a series of uh, stupidities. I feel you. Um, this next question is, is pretty big, but um, I think is related. Can the United States afford peace with North Korea in view of Korea's vital role in maintaining US hegemony in Northeast Asia, and especially now as conflict deepens with China? Well, that's a very, very, very good question because our troops in South Korea are seen in terms of a defense of Taiwan, uh, a defense of Japan, and a defense of South Korea if it comes to that. But of course, China is not gonna attack South Korea, but China might well attack Taiwan. Our troops in Okinawa, uh, halfway between Japan and Taiwan are, are there uh, basically to defend Taiwan or, or intervene if there's another Korean war. And you have Japan, which is the third largest economy in the world. And it has a pipsqueak army 
that uh, you know go, gets nosebleed if they have to do anything independent of the United States. Uh, the United States has built up their military forces, but always under the wing of the United States. So unfortunately, uh, the problem of American troops in Korea is, is deeply uh, complicated by the fact that they are a front yard defense for Japan, uh, a possible defense of Taiwan, uh, and uh, you know, might be used in a war with China, God forbid. I mean, Don Rumsfeld, when he was defense secretary, he just took 9,000 troops out of Korea and put them in Iraq. You know, like, like you don't like it, tough, tough for you. You know, well, we need 9,000 troops, I'll see you later. Now, it's just what happens when you are so dependent, you know, on the biggest military power in the world. I'd say one more thing, and that is that as I mentioned earlier, Japan's relations with North Korea are still very fraught. They, they don't have any, basically. Uh, and the North Koreans want reparations from Japan for colonial depredations. And South Korea and Japan don't get along very well either. The US is always trying to get South Korea and Japan to cooperate with American hegemony and American defense. Uh, and even Park geun didn't go along with that. So, uh, Japan is just another problem that often doesn't come into this discussion, but it's a very powerful country that doesn't happen to have a powerful military. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's something to consider. In the interest of time, I'm, I'm just going to ask a couple more questions. Um, thank you. This has been so enriching. I feel like we could have a whole webinar for each question that was posed. Um, uh, this one, um, we've seen progressive South Korean leaders like Kim Dae-jung, No Mi-hun, and now Moon Jae-in try to advance inter-Korean reconciliation, but uh, constantly get shut down or hindered by the U.S. Given the extraordinary misinformation put forth about the forgotten war in the U.S., what gives you hope that we will ever end the Korean War and get out of the Korean Peninsula? Well, I really don't see anything happening with your middle of the road Democrat or Republican leaders like Biden. I thought Trump might have it in him to do something different and he did meet with uh, Kim Jong-un, but there was no follow-up and he, he was trying to get the Nobel Prize for bringing an end to the Korean War. That's what I think. I mean, he would, he would say things like, nobody knows that there's still a war in Korea. It's still going on, did you know that? And whenever he says that, it means he didn't know it uh, until somebody told him. I mean, he said Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. What do you think of that? Uh, you know, this was a revelation to him. So we're, we're dealing with the most dangerous president in American history, I think, simply because he's, he's so volatile. Uh, and uh, I don't, like I said earlier, I don't expect anything out of him um, when it comes to North Korea before the election. Uh, with Biden, if he gets elected, I, I, I just think you probably have a, you know, another round of sanctions on North Korea, maybe some talks. Uh, but if, if he's going to see North Korean nuclear weapons through the lenses of nonproliferation, it's a non-starter. It's not going to work. Uh, so I, I lied, actually. We are out of time. So that was the last question. Um, this has been amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Cummings, um, for taking this time to reflect with us and, and for your lifelong advocacy for peace in Korea. It's what gives all of us hope. Um, and I hope, you know, thank you for the shout out to Women Cross DMZ. Um, we, your work really inspires us and uh, will keep um, pushing us forward. You know, um, one other thing is uh, you mentioned my age, which is quite advanced. <laughs> Uh, but the last time I was in Korea, which was a couple of years ago, some academic said to me, well, we really want to welcome you to Korea because this might be the last time. And I looked at him, I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> what, do you think, what do you think is going to happen? Anyway. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, well, uh, you don't have to log off just yet. Uh, I, I'm going to make a couple of announcements. Um, if we could... Um, Let's see. 
Well, first of all, um, I, I just wanted to note um, that thanks to so many of, of you all who are watching today, um, you've really been pushing your Congress members and we've had several release um, really great statements actually calling for an end to the war. Um, just this morning, Representative Jayapal tweeted, it's time to officially end it. Uh, Representative Presley wrote, I'm proud to co-sponsor H was Res 152 to formally end this conflict. Um, if you're on social media, you know, please reshare and, and continue to encourage your members to uplift this cause. Um, it really does make a difference. Um, now I, I do have a couple of announcements. Uh, if we could um, go into the screen share mode. Great. So uh, as you can see, um, we have from now until July 23rd, we are going to be collecting your uh, personal stories and connections to the Korean War for our virtual vigil. Um, you can go to the link, hopefully someone will share it in the chat, um, submit a personal photo and story and we'll add it to our digital memorial wall. Um, I guess, you know, one of the silver linings of um, quarantine is it's uh, allowed us to connect in, in more um, intimate ways online and, and this is uh, one reflection of that. Um, we'd also like you to save the date for our next webinar, um, which is going to commemorate the signing of the Armistice Agreement, and that event will be on July 23rd. Um, so more information to come, but save the date, July 23rd. Um, finally, I want to give a big shout out to all the people working behind the scenes to make this webinar possible. Um, our interpreter, Unji Kang, our Win Cross DMZ organizers and techies, Hyun Lee, Echo Cho, Yan Hee Kim, Kathleen Richards, um, our partners at Regeneration, Jong Dae and Grace Kim, um, and all of you who tuned in. We know it's the people who are going to end this war. And uh, when we're organized and mobilized, uh, members will act. Um, so we, we really hope that everyone on this call will join our collective advocacy efforts. Um, so thank you all and have a very good night. Thank <laughs> you.